Good morning, everyone. Paul Ruppel here with Fox 29 News Now. Hope you're having a great Wednesday. We've got a couple stories we're following for you this morning. Let's get you out to the first one. This is our Sabina Kyriakos is out at the, covering the Philadelphia schools. They're having some early dismissals today due to the weather. It's, uh, students will be getting out early again. It's too hot. Many schools in our area do not have central air conditioning units. It's too hot for students and teachers to get through their lessons. Here's Sabina. She was live this morning at Masterman School in Spring Garden. And here at Masterman, we've been talking to kids and parents as the school day got underway. And they tell me it is like a sauna inside of the building. This is at 17th and Spring Garden. Masterman, one of the best schools, not just in the city, but in the country. And it is one of the roughly 40% of Philadelphia public schools that have only air conditioning units in some of the windows. They don't have central AC, so only some of the classrooms are cooled down some of the offices as well so staff telling us on social media that yesterday before the early dismissal bell rang at one o'clock the building had gotten to be absolutely sweltering they said that even the top floors from the third floor on up to the fifth floor were uh, unbearable was a word that they described so a lot of parents not happy with the district because of the uh, early start to the school year, a full week before Labor Day. That was on Monday. That was the first day of class. Uh, and a lot of parents saying, hey, listen, you know that August is hot, especially now with the heat wave. Uh, so they don't think that the district should have started early. Here's some parents that we spoke with. Uh, one parent from Masterman who tells us that even before the heat wave, her son's class was sweltering. I think it's ridiculous, and I also think it's ridiculous that they started in August. It's good. They, I mean, they don't have any central air inside, so it's good for the kids because they can go home where it's air conditioned because it's really, really hot. It is an inconvenient because I had to quit working <laughs> half a day. I went to public school. We didn't have air conditioning. We made it. They shut the lights, and that was it. <laughs> And we made it. Now the district tells us, hey, they were just trying to give these kids the best start possible. They wanted kids to really get into the swing of things, get into the swing of attendance, and also start getting ready for those standardized tests in December and January. Uh, and maybe it was a bit of a gamble, but they say that's what they were trying to do. But again, early dismissal day two at one o'clock citywide public school. So parents. You got to make other arrangements. Got to come pick up your kids. That's the latest right now. We're in, we're in Spring Garden. Sabina Korea Coast, Fox 29 News. Back to you. That was our Sabina Korea Coast reporting on the early dismissals for Philadelphia School District students. Of course, they started before Labor Day uh, this year with a full week. Uh, Philly schools aren't the only ones having problems. Schools in Marsville, Bucks County are dismissing early too today by 11:30. We're told. Let's get you some more. Uh, stories here. Philadelphia police have arrested a suspect in a deadly stabbing at Jefferson Station earlier this month. Sources tell us officers made the arrest last night at a North Philadelphia home after receiving a tip. Police have not released the identity of the person they arrested. Back on August 9th, a man was killed at the busy Center City Station. And a coach doesn't like a call, and instead of letting it go, he apparently punched a referee at a summer recreation league basketball game last night in West Philadelphia. It was caught on videotape. Police say the coach who threw the punch at the game at the 48th and Woodland Playground is 26-year-old Antoine Hart. He faces aggravated assault, recklessly endangering another person, and a new state charge of assaulting against a sports official. The referee, Perry Ivory, was unconscious for five minutes. He was hospitalized with a concussion for four days. Here's what police had to say about the incident, and then you'll hear from uh, Perry Ivory, the, the referee himself. The referee is, has his hands down, knocks him to the ground, he hits his head on the ground. I suffered a seizure while I was getting a scan on my, you know, on my brain. I was in a machine yeah. getting a scan. I suffered a, a, a seizure. Again, the coach uh, suffering a concussion there was hospital for four, uh, hospitalized for four days as a result. And the coach accused in this case, 26-year-old Antoine Hart, faces aggravated assault, recklessly endangering another person, and a new state charge of assaulting against assault against a sports official.
Let's take a look at the weather we were talking about earlier. We are in the midst of a heat wave. Dangerous heat occurring across the area. We'll take a look at future feels like temperatures. At 3 o'clock this afternoon, it's going to feel like 103 in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, I think I've seen some reports that it could get as warm as 107 uh, later in the day. 106 feels like temperature. Uh, let's back up a little bit and show you the, uh, the heat wave again. Let's see our current conditions right now. We have two stations reporting right now. These look to be a little bit outdated, so let's get you... Got some video here from other weather conditions. Here is the current heat index. Oh, we're still missing a couple locations. Let's get our highs yesterday. Uh, the temperature high, our average for this time of year, this part of August, is about 84 degrees. You see, we were 10 degrees above that in Philadelphia. We got to 94. Cooler at the shore, only 84 there, uh, but 90s throughout much of the rest of the area. Despite the hot conditions, we're calling it a, uh, that was yesterday's number, we were at seven yesterday. Let's get you that seven day forecast. A couple problems there with our weather images, but uh, today it's gonna be a 95 heat wave. This continues, late storms on Thursday, 90 degrees when the Eagles play. Those are up in the upper 70s now. We're calling yesterday and today sevens, and then a six on Friday because it's going to be cooler with a shower, high of 79. Saturday, Temple and the Phillies in, uh, playing. Clouds around with a high of 82. Sunday, partly sunny, 86. Monday, par Labor Day, partly sunny, 89 degrees. And looks like a repeat on Tuesday, 89 again, partly sunny. Phillies are back in town. The Eagles are playing at the link on Thursday night. Lots of sports options in town right now. We've got some election coverage from last night. Some big election results this morning that may provide an important forecast for both parties. Voters went to the polls in three states, and as Doug Luzeda reports from Washington, the outcomes may tell us much more about the upcoming midterm contests. Are y'all ready to flip for the blue? Yeah! Tallahassee Mayor Andrew Gillum, fueled by a relatively right. far-left agenda and the backing of socialist Bernie Sanders, pulled off an upset, winning the Florida Democratic primary for governor on the warpath against President Trump. We are going to remind this nation of what is truly the American way. And while Gillum may have won running in part against Trump, his upcoming Republican opponent, Congressman Ron DeSantis, did just the opposite. I want to thank him for his support. I want to thank him for entrusting me with viewing me as somebody who could be a great leader for Florida. So, so thank you, Mr. President. A Trump-backed candidate won the Republican Senate primary in Arizona as well. Martha McSally had been something of a Trump critic, but then pivoted toward him during her campaign. And she will face Democratic Representative Kirsten Sinema, who has tempered her far-left stances in an effort to flip a Senate seat in a state with a history of electing Republicans. We are going to be in for what we now have uh, described as a toss-up race. This is an evenly matched race between two good candidates uh, in McSally and Sinema, and it's going to be a doozy. Again, that was Doug Luzeda reporting from Washington, D.C. Today is the first of two days for, of services for Senator John McCain in Arizona. We've got some video. McCain will lie in state at the Arizona Capitol building. Arizona Governor Doug Ducey is expected to speak at a private ceremony there this morning. Later on today, the Capitol will be open to the public. 
The McCain family spokesman Rick Davis says the viewing will go on as long as people are willing are waiting in line. Today also marks what it would have been McCain's 82nd birthday. We actually have a live look right now at people lined up at the Arizona Capitol to see the senator. Um, let's get you out to your morning business outlook. Uh, drivers are on track for a cheaper ride this fall. Fox Business Network's Tracy Carrasco has more in today's morning business outlook. Good morning. The S&P 500 and the Nasdaq notching new record highs yesterday over optimism about a possible trade deal with Canada. AAA is forecasting a drop in gas prices. AAA says the national gas price will be around $2.70 a gallon this fall. That's down from current prices of $2.84 a gallon and more than a quarter cheaper than this year's high of $2.97 set in May. AAA says prices will drop because of cheaper to produce gas, stable crude oil prices in August, and decreased demand after Labor Day. Sears has expanded its ship to store program to install tires for customers who buy them at Amazon. The program is now available nationwide, including Alaska and Hawaii, after launching in May at 47 Sears Auto Center locations in eight metro areas. That's business. For more, log on to foxbusiness.com. In New York, I'm Tracy Carrasco. The stock market's having a stellar August. That's the headline right now, one of the headlines at Fox Business Network. And they're looking at what's next. As of Monday, the, the NASDAQ composite was up 4.5%. On post to track its largest monthly gain since May when it rose 5.32%. The Dow Jones is up about 2.49%. In July, the Dow gained 4.7%. And the S&P 500 is on track to finish the month up 2.8% following August 3.6% advance. So uh, some of those numbers were as of Monday, but not a whole lot of change yesterday. Um, the Dow is currently down only 9 points, 0.04% New York Stock Exchange. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is still 26,000 points, 26,056. Got a little bit of consumer news for you here. An important warning for parents. This is a concerning children's Advil. Bubblegum flavor children's Advil is being recalled. The label may be confusing. This is only certain, uh, certain of the product, so we'll give you the details here. The dosage cup is marked in teaspoons, while the instructions are, inscri are described in milliliters. The fear is that this could lead to accidental overdoses. Bottles are marked with an expiration date of November 2020. We have more information on this on our website, fox29.com. Want to let you know it's also day two for public viewing for the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin. Lines have already formed in Detroit this morning around the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History where her body is lying in state. Some of this video is from the tributes yesterday. Tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, there, will be a, tomorrow there will be a star studded music tribute honoring the late singer. Franklin's funeral service will be held on Friday and will be limited to family, friends, and special guests. been tracking back to school and covering various aspects of getting your family ready for the uh, big event. Um, some students have been back already. Uh, others are going back after Labor Day. Let's show you, uh, this is a segment from Good Day this morning where we're talking about how much sleep students should be getting. Uh, students, parents, babies, we covered the whole range here. Kids are already back in school, as you know, uh, but others still have a few more days of freedom. So, Karen, are we talking about sleep schedules here? Well, we're trying to 
trying to get the kids back on schedule. Yeah. So we brought back a doctor. We brought in a doctor. Is this your yeah. first time on TV for us? For live, yeah. Oh, I love it. Thank you. Dr. Megan Walls from Nemours here to get us on our schedule. So let's start off. We're trying to get our kids um, back on track. What do we do? What's the first thing we can do? So one of the things that we can do, and I know some kids already started school, but mm -hmm. is to help kids get into it, kind of ease their way into it. So maybe starting moving bedtime like 15 minutes earlier at night and trying to get them sort of back to where they were in a slow manner. Um, and for the kids who already started, still doing that because we still need to get them back on track. I always say uh, tired kids are good kids. What can we do in terms of like exercise? Sure. So we know that if kids exercise and they're moving, then they're more tired at night. They'll go to bed easier for sure. The only thing I tell people to be a little careful about is sometimes, especially for younger kids, if they exercise right before bed, then they're more stimulated and can't, kind of can't fall asleep. And they're all wound up. Yes, okay, they are. Um, so yeah. what's next? So the other thing is um, we want to make sure that kids are getting enough hours of sleep. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people think, Eight hours. Everyone needs eight hours. But actually, young kids, especially school-age kids, we say 9 to 11. Yes. So I ask parents, count back from what time they have to get up in the morning. Don't just assume this, this bedtime is the right time for your kid. Um, and we know consistency is really important. So there's a lot of research that says kids who go to bed the same time every night on a consistent basis have better behavior, they behave, behave better, uh, better academics, all those types of things. We I really struggle with my kids. They are like delay artists where all of a sudden I'm like, 8 o'clock bedtime. They're like, I'm so hungry. I haven't eaten. Or like, no, I need a shower. Uh, one sure. of the things they do say to keep us on schedule, though, is to actually get them clean. I would say cleanliness is next to godliness, but that helps to wind them down. Yeah, definitely. So a couple things. One is, I think you're 100% right. Delay tactics happen from a very early age, mm -hmm. right? Um, but the thing that I talk to parents about a lot is let's figure out a good bedtime routine. So a lot of times that does include a bath or a shower. And then after that, really quiet activities. So books or something quiet like that, stories, much to teenagers' dismay, not social media. Um, Get the so, screens out so of the room. screens out, and actually we know that for kids, screens are hugely stimulating. So the light, the sound, all of those things are actually waking them up instead of winding them down. Um, so we tell parents, try that hour before bed really get rid of those And screens. I've started reading books because we had to finish that summer reading, so we're cramming it all in right now. We're trying to for get sure. it all done. For sure. So we'll do all those. Those are great tips. My only problem is we get them a little bit on these next couple days, mm -hmm. and then we go right into the holiday weekend. Sure. So, you know, summer, things fall apart. Um, one weekend, things can fall apart. And what I tell parents is try to stay somewhat within the limits. So if right. you're off an hour or two, okay. But don't put kids to bed at midnight when you were putting them to bed at 8 last week for school because that kind of caused the problem. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, Amazing. you're Amazing. We're all going to be in the struggle together. We will all try. Um, so thank you so much. And I'm going to send it over to you, Mike. All right. Can I ask a question? Sure. Of the doctor while she's here? Yeah. Sure. I always hear different times. How much hours of sleep certain ages should we get? We have that. Oh, you're right. Thank you, Mike. Well, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like if so, you're a toddler. So I think up here you'll see the, you know, the, the kind of general 17. hours. 17? Um, yeah, that's babies. Remember when your newborn came home and maybe you thought they never slept, well, but they true. actually did sleep a lot. Um, toddlers, 11 to 14. Uh, preschoolers 10 to 13 but this wow. includes naps for these kiddos remember so a lot of these kids are napping for two or three hours yeah. during sure. the day um but school age is 9 to 11 so mm -hmm. that's i think i think like i said people think eight hours um and then teenagers eight to ten i don't think most of our teenagers get anywhere close to that but they really should those are goals <laughs> yeah. yeah definitely our sleep definitely goals. goals thank you doctor <laughs> yeah. i know the teenagers sleep that long on weekends yes <laughs> i remember i used to eh, one o'clock in the afternoon get up all right here's something There was our segment about uh, making sure your children are getting enough sleep as you return to school, get back into good patterns and good uh, place to have them ready for school each morning. I want to get you a little bit of video from this morning. This was another segment that we did. We were out at a surprise guest was giving away thousands of backpacks to students in the Philadelphia School District. Thomas Drayton was at Thomas G. Blaine Elementary School in Strawberry Mansion to explain. I'm in the audience right now, don't want to get in the way because this is exactly what all the students, well, this was a surprise, so they didn't know, but now there's at Blaine Elementary School, the very school little Meek Mill attended 25 years ago, and the students here, they got quite the surprise. This is a back-to-school assembly. Superintendent William Height here, Mayor Jim Kenney's here, in collaboration to celebrate the backpack giveaway, Meek Mill. 6,000 backpacks in 12 different area schools, and he's going to visit four of the schools here. 
uh, personally to give the backpacks. So once again, Meek Mill on stage. This is a collaboration to give out 6,000 backpacks to each one of these students. He said earlier, you know, growing up in Philly, I've watched families struggle to make ends meet, to buy basic school supplies. Those memories stay with you, and that's why I'm committed to give back to the families in my hometown. He wants uh, the school year to start off right with the right school supplies. So once again, he's on stage surprising the students here at Blaine Elementary with free backpacks, part of his commitment to get back to the community along with school supplies. So he's going to make his way around. I'm going to go through my crowd here because the kids are super excited. He literally just arrived here about a minute, two minutes ago, and the students were absolutely going crazy because they didn't expect this. But one by one, each one of these backpacks going to 6,000 students here in the Philadelphia School District. As soon as he's done giving these backpacks, I'm going to talk to Meek Mill. We'll bring it to you here on Good Day as well as at 5 o'clock. Okay, if he happens to talk to you live, just let us know. We'll punch you right back up. Thank uh, you, Tom. How cool is that? It's Super really cool. cool. And of course that Meek has a long tradition of doing these kinds of giveaways and helping in the yeah. community because he certainly has had his struggles over the year for about 10 years. Yeah. He's had um, some legal issues and then he had the issue we just got released on uh, bail and he's out right now. And he's got the issue with Judge Janice Brinkley um, who denied his request. Um, to you know, have it not have a you know another trial again. So right, well, that's another aspect of his life. Yeah, uh, can a fast food? You heard Thomas Drayton promise there to uh, bring us some sound with Meek Mill when he became available, and he made good on that promise right after a commercial break. Here is what Meek Mill had to say at the event. Oh no, I didn't really talk about that. I used to be on honor roll actually when I was going to the school. Yeah. I moved into a different neighborhood and things got different. Yeah, yeah. So, Michelle, can you talk about your case and how, where things stand right now and how you're feeling about it? Uh, my case is in a higher course. You know, I don't know where things stand at. You know, it's in, a, in the hands of higher court. So, you know, I wouldn't know until they make decisions. I'm good. You think about Made in America and the city's argument with Jay Z this weekend? Huh? The, the location of Made in America, the argument that Jay Z had with the city. Any comment? No, I didn't think it was an argument. I think they was just uh, getting to the bottom of business and making sure everything worked for uh, the city of Philadelphia and Rock Nation itself. And all the hardship that you've gone through, you still rep Philly really hard. Uh, say it and again. After all the hardship you've been through, you still rep Philly really, really hard. Why is that important to you? Uh, you know, this is the only place I know where I've grown up my whole life. Uh, I'm a baby, you know, and, and it made me the, into the man I am today. Actually, made me into a strong person. Yeah. to the community. I just don't publicize it every time we do it, but, you know, now we're going to publicize every move I make and everything I do because if something go wrong, it'll be publicized. So we publicize everything we do that's right nowadays. So, you know, and if, huh? Uh, it's a good feeling. It's, it's, it's actually a good feeling. Me, I've been up all night. I was in the studio all night to uh, 7 in the morning, flew here, came and gave our uh, bass, uh, book bags and, and, and met the children. I seem a little restless, but inside I'm always excited just to get uh, love from my city on any level. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Again, that was Meek Mill uh, talking about the event he was at, giving out backpacks. Uh, our Thomas Drayton caught him up with him at Thomas G. Blaine Elementary School in Strawberry Mansion. I believe I heard them say they're giving away 6,000 backpacks in all. So, nice event there for students as they're getting back to class. Let's get you another live look here. This is the outside the um, services, the, not the services, but the uh, Senator John McCain lying in state at the Arizona Capitol. See lines of people, authorities, lots of folks there to uh, attend the event. Of course, the center's body will eventually be transported back to Washington, D.C., where he's lying in state at the Capitol, I believe. And there will be services over the next couple days. We're going to be carrying some of them for you on fox29.com, on Facebook, and I believe some live on air. There will be some uh, cut-ins to cover some of those events. We'll have them for you as Arizonans and his Senate comrades also 
his counterparts in the Senate say their goodbyes to the senator. Let's also take let's take a live look outside our studios right now. Get you a look at weather again. It's currently 84 degrees with a dew point of 75. So it's very humid and sticky again as this heat wave continues. There is a wind southwest out of the southwest at nine miles per hour. It was it has been breezy a little bit in the city, although it feels a little bit like a hair dryer. It's blowing so hot. Of course, there's a look at our dangerous heat wave that's occurring right now in the city. I want to let you know, most importantly, that there is a heat advisory in effect right now. I'm going to show that to you. This is for dangerous heat. feels like temperatures of 100 to 105. See, it's much of the Philadelphia metro area. All of Delaware, all of South Jersey, much of eastern Pennsylvania. It's going to feel like 100 to 105 degrees. National Weather Service said today another hot day is expected. The forecast maximum heat index, uh, I believe, hits 106 for the city of Philadelphia as it did yesterday. Avoid strenuous activity during the hottest part of the day, and if you do have to be outside, take frequent breaks and drink plenty of water. Here's your daily planner. The, the temperature high will be 95 degrees. Hazy sunshine, those feels like temperatures in the three digits. Winds at southwest might even pick up a little bit to 10 to 15 miles per hour. Sunset time is creeping up a little bit. It's now 7.37 p.m. here in the city. We have a look at the forecast for the Eagles game tomorrow night at Lincoln Financial Stadium. Uh, let's do these in the right order. <laughs> uh, it looks like it'll be about 93 degrees on Thursday at 6 p.m. Then we'll be at 87 around 8 p.m., a little bit after kickoff. And as the night goes on, after 11 p.m., it'll be about 83 degrees with a wind out of the northeast at 7 miles per hour. That's our future cast call for the Eagles game Thursday night, tomorrow night against the Jets, final preseason game number four. I want to let you know we are awaiting a news conference from the U.S. District Attorney's Office in the Eastern District, Pennsylvania. So this is in Philadelphia. We're told that uh, U.S. Attorney William McSwain is holding this news conference to announce criminal charges in a significant matter. He'll be joined by officials from the, uh, the FBI and the, Secu uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, of course, and the Securities Exchange Commission, the SEC. That's slated to begin any moment now. Was expected to start at 10.30. We will have that for you live as soon as it begins. While we're waiting, let's get you another look at your seven-day forecast. As we said, heat wave continues. 95 degrees for a high today. Late storms on Thursday, 90 degrees. Friday looks cooler. It's going to be set only 79. You'll see those overnight lows start to dip back towards 70. The high 79 Friday, cooler with a shower. Saturday, with Phillies and Temple playing, clouds around 82 degrees. Sunday, partly sunny, 86. So it's looking dry for your holiday weekend so far. You got some clouds Saturday, partly sunny Sunday, and that's the same call for. Monday, warming up a bit to 89 degrees for those backyard barbecues and other outdoor events. Tuesday, back to school for a lot of people, back to work for some who have been on vacation trying to get the last bit of the unofficial uh, end of summer here. Uh, we'll be, they'll be going back to work on Tuesday to partly sunny skies, 89 degrees.
taking a look to see if our event is ready to begin just yet, but it's not there. Here's a look at the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. While we await the start of this news conference, let's take you on a tour of our weather metrics cameras. Here we go. Crowded beaches on the shores there in Ocean City, New Jersey. Lots of them, beach umbrellas up already. People out enjoying the sunshine. Looks a little, looks maybe a little misty there in the morning. See the lifeguard pushing out a boat. Should be a busy weekend at the shore with those, with that forecast. Here's a look at Reading, Pennsylvania. A little bit of construction going on in the foreground. All right, we're going to take you live to the news conference. Again, this is the U.S. Attorney's Office, Eastern District, Pennsylvania, where they're expected to announce criminal charges. Looks like our shot is frozen temporarily. Charges of insider trading against Damilare Sonoiki, a former associate at a global investment bank in New York City and currently a resident of California, and Michael Kendricks, the former Philadelphia Eagles linebacker and current member of the Cleveland Browns. Maintaining the integrity and the stability of the financial markets is a major priority of my office, the United States Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, and the U.S. Department of Justice. Sound financial markets contribute to the health of our entire economy, and these markets only work when everybody shows respect for the law. When individuals engage in insider trading, the buying and selling securities based on material, non-public information, it undermines the public's faith in our markets and harms ordinary investors who do play by the rules. As alleged in the criminal information filed earlier today, Mr. Sonoiki and Mr. Kendricks were definitely not playing by the rules. Each has been charged with one count of conspiracy to commit securities fraud and one count of securities fraud. As charged from July 2013 until May 2015, Mr. Sonoiki was an associate 
at a global investment bank. Among other things, among other things, the investment bank advised clients regarding potential mergers and acquisitions. And Mr. Sonoiki had a fiduciary duty to the investment bank's clients to maintain the confidentiality of ongoing negotiations. As alleged, Mr. Sonoiki, a Harvard-educated former banker, did not abide by that duty. Within a year of beginning his employment at the investment bank, he was brazenly committing crimes. He is alleged to have passed material non-public information to an acquaintance, Mr. Kendricks, and as alleged in the charging documents, from at least on or about July 1st, 2014, through at least on or about March 26, 2015, Mr. Sonoiki illegally provided Mr. Kendricks with information about the investment bank's clients, including material non-public information about pending mergers and acquisitions. In turn, Mr. Kendricks used the material non-public information that he received from Mr. Sonoiki to buy call options on companies including CompuWare, Move, Sapien and Oplink prior to public merger announcements. A call option gives the owner the right to buy a specified number of shares at a set price, called the strike price, before a given date, called the expiration date, after which the call option will expire and become worthless. After the public merger announcement regarding each of these four companies, Mr. Kendricks sold the call options for a substantial profit. Mr. Sonoiki and Mr. Kendricks attempted to cover their tracks, including by using FaceTime to share inside information in an attempt to avoid detection by law enforcement. Mr. Kendricks made a large profit from his insider trading, collecting just under $1.2 million. In return for this inside information regarding the investment bank clients, Mr. Kendricks provided approximately $10,000 in cash and tickets to Philadelphia Eagles games to Mr. Sonoiki. I'd like to direct your attention to a chart to my left that gives a brief outline of the conspiracy. You have Mr. Sonoiki, who has the material non-public information. He then provided it to Mr. Kendricks, who executed the trades. He then reaped the illegal trading profits, and then he made the illegal payments back to Mr. Sonoiki, completing the conspiracy. Can we go to the second chart, please? As you can see from the chart on my left, based on the alleged insider trading related to CompuWare, Mr. Kendricks made a purchase of approximately $60,000 in call option contracts, and after the public merger announcement, sold those same option contracts for approximately $138,000, which was a 130% increase. With respect to move, Mr. Kendricks made a purchase of approximately $71,000 and sold after the public merger announcement for approximately $350,000 which constituted a 393% increase. For Sapien, Mr. Kendricks made a purchase of approximately $146,000 in call option contracts and sold them after the public merger announcement for approximately $635,000, which was a 335% increase. Finally, with Oplink, Mr. Kendricks purchased the call option contracts for approximately $446,000 and sold them after the public merger announcement for approximately $798,000, which was a 79% increase from the purchase price. Can you go to the next chart, please? All told, Mr. Kendricks made a profit of approximately $78,000 from his CompuWare investments, approximately $279,000 from Move, approximately $489,000 from Sapient, and approximately 352,000 from Oplink for a total of approximately, as I stated previously, $1.2 million. At this time, I want to take this opportunity to thank the hardworking and dedicated law enforcement personnel 
and prosecutors who investigated and charged this case. The Federal Bureau of Investigation and the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission led the way in this investigation. I want to offer a special thank you to FBI Special Agent in Charge Michael Harpster, Assistant Special Agent in Charge Christian Zajac, Supervisory Special Agent Joe McGinn, and FBI Special Agents Patricia Curran and Patrick Duffy for their dedicated work in this case. A special thank you also to the co-director of the SEC's Division of Enforcement, Stephanie Avakian, SEC Regional Director, Jeff Bajukas, the Social Regional Director of Enforcement, Kelly Gibson, Chief of the SEC's Market Abuse Unit, Joe Sansone, SEC Senior Counsel Rachel Clark, Regional Trial Counsel Jennifer Berry, and SEC Investigator Pat McCluskey. And from my office, a big thank you to Assistant U.S. Attorney David Ignall for prosecuting this case on behalf of the Department of Justice. Mr. Sinoiki and Mr. Kendricks are alleged to have cheated the markets, cheated other investors, and placed themselves above the law. I want the community to know that the FBI, the SEC, and the U.S. Attorney's Office will do everything in our collective power to protect our financial markets and safeguard against insider trading and other kinds of securities fraud. If you commit insider trading or any kind of securities fraud in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, we will prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law. Your background, your education, your professional success will not save you. It will not matter who you are. It will only matter what you did and eventually your crimes will catch up to you. At this time, I'd like to turn the podium over to Christian Zajac, the FBI Assistant Special Agent in Charge, who will share some remarks on behalf of the FBI. After Mr. Zajac's remarks, Stephanie Avakian, the co-director of the SEC's Division of Enforcement, will provide remarks on behalf of the SEC. And following Ms. Avakian's remarks, we will be available to briefly take your questions. Thank you. Good morning. At the heart of insider trading cases is the concept of a level playing field. Investors bet on individual stocks based on public knowledge of a company's past performance and future plans. As outlined in the information, Michael Kendricks used material non-public information provided by his co-defendant, co Mr. Sinoiki, to score significant profits from expected market moves. This is not gaming the system. It's a federal crime. This was a well-coordinated, scripted effort whereby the subjects employed specific measures to mask their activities. These measures highlighted that Mr. Kendricks and Mr. Sinoiki knew what they were doing was wrong. Insider trading, trading has long posed a threat to U.S. financial markets because as our U.S. Attorney stated, it compromises the public's trust that make our, our markets operate fairly. For this reason, the FBI takes seriously our responsibility to investigate insider trading and other serious financial crimes. The FBI looks forward to continued efforts with the Eastern District of Pennsylvania and our partners at the SAC to aggressively identify and root out such fraudulent practices. At this time, I, I would like to commend the FBI special agents who investigated this case, Patricia Curran and Patrick Duffy, as well as Assistant U.S. Attorney David Ignall for their tireless efforts throughout the course of this investigation. Further, I would also like to commend and thank our partners with the Securities Exchange Commission. Now Ms. Avakian is going to offer remarks on behalf of the SEC. Good morning. As Bill, uh, as Bill said, my name is Stephanie Avakian, and I am co-director of the SEC's Division of Enforcement. I'd like to start by thanking Bill McSwain and his team here at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Philadelphia, as well as Christian Zajac of the FBI's Philadelphia Field Office and the agents who worked on the parallel criminal matter. Today, the SEC filed insider trading charges against Michael Kendricks, 
formerly a linebacker with the world champion Philadelphia Eagles, and also against his horse, Damilare Sinoiki. The SEC's complaint alleges that Kendricks made nearly $1.2 million by trading ahead of four separate acquisition announcements based on tips from Sinoiki, who worked at an, at an investment bank that provided advice on each of those deals. In return for these tips, the SEC alleges that Kenricks paid Sinoiki in cash and other benefits, including Eagles tickets and access to celebrity-type events with Kenricks. I'd like to commend the excellent work of the SEC staff members who investigated this case. They are Pat McCluskey, Rachel Clark, Jennifer Barry, Kelly Gibson, and Joe Sansone. This case really highlights the continued success of the SEC Enforcement Division's insider trading program. We have successfully detected and pursued insider trading schemes of all shapes and sizes, from massive international schemes to those perpetrated by a single insider. And in the past five years alone, thanks to the staff's hard work, expertise, and use of highly effective proprietary analytical tools, the SEC has filed more than 250 insider trading cases against more than 450 defendants. In this case, members of the SEC's Market Abuse Unit, a specialized group within the Division of Enforcement, were able to link trading in Kendrick's brokerage account with an IP address belonging to Sinoiki, effectively uncovering the investment banker's central role in this scheme. From this piece of evidence, we developed a compelling record showing how Sinoiki helped Kendricks trade in advance of the four corporate deals, netting a total of roughly $1.2 million in ill-gotten profits. As alleged in the complaint, the trail that the staff uncovered included defendants' creation and funding of a new brokerage account to place the illicit trades, coded communications sent in furtherance of their alleged scheme, and Kendrick's compensation of Sinoiki with cash kickbacks and other hard-to-trace perks. We allege that at the outset of the scheme, Sinoiki, whose trading was restricted by his employer, helped Kendrick set up a new account that both men could access. As alleged in our complaint, on July 18th, Sinoiki joined Kendrick's at a nightclub appearance. The very next morning, while Sinoiki was at Kendrick's apartment in Philadelphia, the two opened a new online brokerage account in Kendrick's name. Kendrick's then funded this new account with $80,000 transferred from a different brokerage account. And in what we allege was an attempt to avoid potential questions about this transfer, Kendrick's structured this transaction so that the money was not transferred directly into the new brokerage account, but rather first to his checking account and from there into the new account. Soon after, they began their trading. And as alleged in the complaint, Kendricks and Sinoiki used a variety of methods to disguise their scheme. For example, after Kendricks set up the new brokerage account, he and Sinoiki used coded language in a text discussing the arrival of the initial $80,000 into the account, pretending instead that the text was about changing the number on Kendricks' jersey from 95 to 80. Similarly, shortly after their first successful trade, Sinoiki sent Kendricks a text message to arrange to get a kickback by asking for bread, claiming in the text to prefer the bread used for Philly cheesesteaks over the bread in New York City. In what we allege was an attempt to conceal these kickbacks, Kendricks paid Sinoiki in cash and celebrity perks. The cash payments were made at in-person meetings, including one at 30th Street Station, where Sinoiki rode the train to pick up his money. Some of the perks included things like tickets to Eagles games and arranging for Sinoiki to visit Kendricks on the set of a pop star's music video. Uncovering this conduct is a testament to the dedication and the talent of the staff of the SEC, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and the FBI. Insider trading threatens investor confidence in the fairness and integrity of our markets. We will continue to dedicate our resources to pursuing insider traders and holding them accountable regardless of their celebrity or their status. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Chris. Uh, at this time, we will take some questions. We will do our best to answer your questions, but I think you understand that we may not be able to give you a complete answer to all of your questions. We have certain uh, policies and requirements that we have to abide by, but we'll do our best to be as transparent as we can. Hold on a second.
We're not going to discuss, at least on the criminal side, um, the evidence at this point. Uh, that will come out in court. Uh, the, the SEC uh, complaint does have some more details in it than the criminal information, but I don't believe um, that we're prepared to answer that question today unless Stephanie has a different view. Okay. Sir. There are currently no court appearances scheduled, but that will happen um, relatively shortly. As you know, the, the, the charges were just filed today, and so now it has to crank its way through the, the, uh, the process. But there's not currently, for example, an initial appearance scheduled for either gentleman, but I anticipate it will happen shortly. They are not, obviously, were they notified that this is going to happen prior to right now, or is this news to them as well as to us? We have been in touch with their counsel. That all has to be worked out in the future. Sir. Correct. And information is one of the several ways that we can charge cases in the federal system. Um, the one thing I can say about it is we can only charge by information when we have the defendant's consent to charge in that manner. But whether they plead guilty or whether they go to trial or whatever happens in the case will have to be determined in the court process in the future. And again, I'm going to keep myself to the four corners of the information where um, they're described as acquaintances, and I uh, can't comment further on the evidence, but that all of that presumably will come out in court at a later time. On the criminal side, um, it's hard to say, obviously, at this point what exactly they'd be facing for a number of reasons. The sentencing guidelines in the federal system influence uh, what happens if, if and when there is a conviction. And again, this is only an accusation at this point. Um, and the sentencing guidelines can be complicated, and that needs to be calculated uh, later if there is a conviction. But I will say, generally, that um, if convicted, both gentlemen are facing what could be substantial prison time. I really can't comment on that other than to say that we had to have their consent to file it in this manner. But what happens from here will have to um, come out in the court process. I mentioned the dates of the conspiracy in the information. Um, I also mentioned the dates of Mr. Sunoki's employment uh, at the investment bank, but I did not get into the details of the timeline and the investigation, and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to answer that. I'm sorry, in the back? Um, Mr. Kendricks is being represented by Michael Schwartz at Pepper Hamilton, and uh, Mr. Sunoiki is being represented by the Federal Defenders. I can't really comment on that, but again, that will come out in the court process. Um, all that we, all that we, well, we have said, um, and I've told you the dates that he was at the investment bank in terms of his um, employment after that. I don't have anything specific to say. Are you identifying the investment bank? No, we are not. We have not identified the investment bank in our in our charging document. That would come in court as well. Yes, that would come out in court. Confess it's in our complaint. It's um, Tiana Taylor. Tiana Taylor. We'll take one more question. Final question. Well, as we as we explained, there were uh, four different there were four different deals that were invested in, and then four sort of large profits that were reaped. The initial eighty thousand dollars was just that. It was the initial that. Ms. Avakian described. Correct. We talked about the, we talked about the time period of the conspiracy. Correct. Correct. Or that that scheme, that scheme has been charged for that amount of time. So Talking about. 
Um, I don't think that's exactly right. That's not, and that's not the way I really described it. I think that what we said was that that was the initial investment of the $80,000. And then we were laying out how in each of the deals, how much was invested and then how much profit was reaped, and then we aggregated it to approximately $1.2 million. Talking about the first chart? Okay, can we put up the first chart? This is going to be the last question. I'm sorry, but um, I'm happy to answer that. And also, these charts are going to be available to you afterwards. So we'll provide copies of them, but sorry, I'll stay by the microphone. So as I described, Mr. Sonoiki had the material non-public information. He then provided it to Mr. Kendricks. Mr. Kendricks executed the trades, reaped the illegal trading profits, and in return, because Mr. Sonoiki wasn't doing this for free, he received payments. As alleged, he received approximately $10,000 plus Eagle tickets and the like. So thank you very much. As alleged, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. You've been watching a news conference at the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, the Philadelphia office. Former Eagles linebacker Michael Kendricks accused in an insider trading scheme. I want to get you, uh, we've just received a statement from the former Eagles linebacker who now plays with the Cleveland Browns. I want to put that up on the screen for you and I'll read from it. This statement it was issued today on the letterhead of his legal uh, representation says I apologize four years ago I participated in insider trading and I deeply regret it I invested money with a former friend of mine who I thought I could trust and who I greatly admired his background as a Harvard graduate and an employee of Goldman Sachs gave me a false sense of confidence to that point I'd worked my tail off since I was five years old to become the football player that I am today. I was drawn in by the allure of being more than just a football player. While I didn't fully understand all of the details of the illegal trades, I knew it was wrong and I wholeheartedly regret my actions. Since the beginning of the investigation, I have fully cooperated with all of the authorities and will continue to do so. I accept full responsibility for my actions. Although I did not take any of the profits for myself, I'm committed to repaying all of the funds gained illegally and accept the consequences of my actions. I sincerely apologize to my coaches, the owners, and my teammates on the Eagles and the Browns, the NFL, and the magnificent fans to whom I owe my career. I also apologize to my family who I have failed in this. You all deserve better, and I will work my hardest to re-earn your trust and respect, serve as an advocate to educate others, and show you that I will never be involved in anything like this again. Thank you for your time and hopefully your forgiveness. Again, that's a statement from Michael Kendricks on the letterhead of his uh, lawyers at Pepper Hamilton LLP, issued today after news conference you've been watching here on Fox 29 News Now, where the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, the SEC, and the FBI announced charges against former Eagles linebacker Michael Kendricks. Let's get you some video of that news conference. This was a few moments ago. Uh, they began talking with a chart that showed the alleged scheme. Let's bring you some of that footage again. As you can see from the chart on my left, based on the alleged insider trading related to CompuWare, Mr. Kendricks made a purchase of approximately $60,000 in call option contracts. And after the public merger announcement, sold those same option contracts for approximately $138,000, which was a 130% increase. 
With respect to move, Mr. Kendricks made a purchase of approximately $71,000 and sold after the public merger announcement for approximately $350,000, which constituted a 393% increase. For Sapient, Mr. Kendricks made a purchase of approximately $146,000 in call option contracts and sold them after the public merger announcement for approximately $635,000 which was a 335% increase. Finally, with Oplink, Mr. Kendricks purchased the call option contracts for approximately $446,000 and sold them after the public merger announcement for approximately $798,000, which was a 79% increase from the purchase price. Here's the next chart, please. All told, Mr. Kendricks made a profit of approximately $78,000 from his CompuWare investments, approximately $279,000 from Move, approximately $489,000 from Sapient, and approximately $352,000 from Oplink for a total of approximately, as I stated previously, $1.2 million. At this time, I want to take this opportunity to thank the hardworking and dedicated law enforcement personnel and prosecutors who investigated and charged this case. The Federal Bureau of Investigation and the U.S. Security and Exchange Commission led the way in this investigation. I want to offer a special thank you to FBI Special Agent in Charge Michael Hartzler, Assistant Special Agent in Charge Christian Zajac, Supervisory Special Agent Joe McGinn, and FBI Special Agents Patricia Curran and Patrick Duffy for their dedicated work in this case. A special thank you also to the co-director of the SEC's Division of Enforcement, Stephanie Avakian, SEC Regional Director, Jeff Bajukas, Associate Regional Director of Enforcement, Kelly Gibson, Chief of the SEC's Market Abuse Unit, Joe Sansone, SEC Senior Counsel, Rachel Clark, Regional Trial Counsel, Jennifer Berry, and SEC Investigator, Pat McCluskey. And from my office, a big thank you to Assistant U.S. Attorney David Ignall for prosecuting this case on behalf of the Department of Justice. Mr. Sinoiki and Mr. Kendricks are alleged to have cheated the markets, cheated other investors, and placed themselves above the law. I want the community to know that the FBI, the SEC, and the U.S. Attorney's Office will do everything in our collective power to protect our financial markets and safeguard against insider trading and other kinds of securities fraud. If you commit insider trading or any kind of securities fraud in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, we will prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law. Your background, your education, your professional success will not save you. It will not matter who you are. It will only matter what you did and eventually your crimes will catch up to you. At this time, I'd like to turn the podium over to Christian Zajac, the FBI Assistant Special Agent in Charge, who will share some remarks on behalf of the FBI. I'm going to bring you back live here. Uh, the Cleveland Browns have just issued a statement. I'll read it for you. Uh, the Browns say, we are aware of the situation and in communication with the Lig office as we gather more information. Mike will, Michael will not make the trip to Detroit. We will comment further at the appropriate time. I believe that is the Browns preseason game against the Detroit Lions. Got to check that for you as we, uh, yep, that's tomorrow night's uh, preseason game against the Lions. Michael Kendricks, the former Eagles linebacker, now with the Browns, will not be making that trip, the team says in a statement. come back live here. Our Fox 29's Chris O'Connell tweeted about this story shortly after the news broke. Uh, he also obtained a statement from Kendrick's attorney and he tells us that his client expects to plead guilty. So Fox 29's Chris O'Connell reporting that the attorney for Michael Kendricks says that his client does expect to ple clear guilt, uh, excuse me, plead guilty, and also provided this statement to us, which we read earlier. Again, it begins that he apologizes 
and that four years ago he participated in insider trading and deeply regrets it. Let's go back and hear a little bit more from that news conference moments ago. From expected market moves. This is not gaming the system. It's a federal crime. This was a well-coordinated, scripted effort whereby the subjects employed specific measures to mask their activities. These measures highlighted that Mr. Kendricks and Mr. Sinoiki knew what they were doing was wrong. Insider trading, trading has long posed a threat to U.S. financial markets because, as our U.S. attorney stated, it compromises the public's trust that make our our markets operate fairly. For this reason, the FBI takes seriously our responsibility to investigate insider trading and other serious financial crimes. The FBI looks forward to continued efforts with the Eastern District of Pennsylvania and our partners at the SEC to aggressively identify and root out such fraudulent practices. At this time, I, I would like to commend the FBI special agents who investigated this case, Patricia Curran and Patrick Duffy, as well as Assistant U.S. Attorney David Ignall, for their tireless efforts throughout the course of this investigation. Further, I would also like to commend and thank our partners with the Securities Exchange Commission. Now, Ms. Abakian is going to offer remarks on behalf of the SEC. Pause it there for you so you can get a look at that chart. Again, the allegation. Good of, morning, uh, as Bill. Uh, let's back it up there. There you go. Uh, again, the allegation is that Michael Kendricks, former Eagles linebacker and a friend, according to his own statement, uh, Dem Demilair Sinoiki. The profit to Michael Kendricks was approximately $1.2 million. Authorities allege this occurred in 2014, so four years ago. And they give dollar amounts there. It appears these were the stocks that the investments were made in and the profit that occurred. Those amounts total up to one, almost $1.2 million. Again, we'll t show you a little bit of uh, the, line form the linebacker's statement. He's now a Cleveland Brown. At the very bottom, he apologized to coaches, owners, and teammates, and the Eagles, and the Browns, the NFL, and the magnificent fans to whom I owe my career. I also apologize to my family who I failed in this. You all deserve better, and I will work my hardest to re-earn your trust and respect, serve as an advocate to educate others, and show you that I will never be involved in anything like this again. Thank you for your time and hopeful your forgiveness. And Kendrick's signature appears just below that. Of course, we have continuing coverage of the story on Fox 20 News, uh, excuse me, fox29.com. Uh, we will uh, have live reports. Bruce Gordon was out at the news conference today for this event. Uh, we'll have reports at 5, 6, 10, and 11 tonight. So please tune in and we'll give you the latest and all the information we have. I want to thank you very much for watching. This has been Fox 29 News Now. Have a great day and we'll uh, have updates for you on fox29.com.